Welcome back to Music Corner. Uh, as always, I'm your host, uh, Mrs. Sally Long Video. Uh, in case you thought the last two videos were too long, <laughs> I think this one's gonna be even longer. Which means I'll never be a YouTube superstar like <laughs> Ray Williams Johnson. The topic we're covering today is my 50 favorite songs from the year 2010, 2010. It is part of a project that I announced earlier this year of doing decade retrospectives on years from the 2010s, the first year that I personally and a lot of people who are coming of age in the internet era were first experiencing music commercially and critically. Earlier this year, I wrote a piece for the blog on my 50 favorite albums of 2010. You don't have to read that to sort of understand this video, but we're gonna be talking about a lot of the same artists. I'll link it in the description if you want to read it. What else will be in the description? Hopefully if I can figure out how to do it, some uh, time codes that link to the specific parts of this video. I know it may be a little bit long if you wanna watch it in chunks of 10 or 25 or however I end up divvying it up, uh, go to the description and do that. And the final thing that will be in the description is a link to the Spotify playlist where you can listen to all of the songs I'm gonna talk about here today. Now there are 50 songs, but one of these tracks is not available on streaming services and I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. So I threw in an honorable mention that you will hear on the playlist that would have been the number 51 on this list had there been one just as a replacement. And without any further ado, I think we're gonna jump into it. We're gonna take it brick by brick and hopefully fly through it. So the honorable mention at number 51 comes to us from Manic Street Preacher's Britpop band with the pop rock anthem postcards for a young man. Starting off the list at number 50, Brandon Flowers, front man of famed alternative and indie rock band The Killers, with his first solo album and the great track Jilted Lovers and Broken Hearts. Next up at number 49, we have not The Weeknd, Abel Tesfaye, but the band Weeknd with their dark, despondent, post-punk jam, Coma Summer. And coming up at number 48, see, we're already flying through them, a pop rock tune that hits all of the right notes today as it did 10 years ago, Drake with the track Over. And at number 47, uh, M.I.A. brings us a tale of the internet age that was ahead of its time from an album that was ahead of its time with the track XXXO. And at number 46, we have an East Coast Wu-Tang Clan heart and soul reunion courtesy of Ghostface Killer. Red Man is on this thing, Method Man is on this thing. There is a killer verse from Raekwon. Of course, I'm talking about the song Troublemakers at number 46. And at number 45, a song that a lot of you are probably familiar with, the fastest, most jittery and up-tempo single of Vampire Weekend's career with the song Cousins. And speaking of jittery and up-tempo, at number 44, we have the manic, explosive, insane, blistering combination of electronica and pop and rock music that Sleigh Bells treat us to on the song Tell Em. <coughs> Shit. At number 43, Beach Fossils, Pioneers, the lo-fi indie bedroom pop song and album that would come to define the 2010s in indie music with their track, Youth. And at number 42, a kooky, hilarious, fantastic use of plunder phonics on the book's song, The Story of Hip Hop. Next up at number 41, a track that I'm sure many of you are also pretty familiar with, Deer Hunter with one of their defining tunes, Helicopter, a song a lot of people would have even higher on this list. And that's 10. We're, uh, we're, we're one fifth of the way through the list, like that. Don't worry, they'll get longer. Coming to number 40, we have Daughters, who at one point it looked like this would be their last record until they came back in 2018 with another great album. The best song from this record being the track The First Supper at number 40. And at number 39, we have the jazzy, groovy, impossibly catchy bop from Janelle Monae, the track Tightrope featuring Big Boy of Outcast fame. And up next, we have one of my favorite tracks from one of the fondest farewells an artist gave in 2010, Gil Scott Heron with New York Is Killing Me. At number 37, we have the first in a long line of great singles from this band that came out in the 2010s. I'm talking about Sam Herring and Future Islands with the song Vareo's Eye. And at number 36, we've got another 
drowsy, long-winded post-punk epic, but an idiosyncratic and infectious one at that. Women with the song Eyesore. Now this is the band that would go on to become Viet Cong and then Preoccupations. So if you've never journeyed this far back into their discography, do it, I promise it's worthwhile. At the next two slots, we have two of the catchiest indie pop songs of 2010. First at number 35, Yay Sayer, with the amazing track Ambling Alp. Seriously, I dare you to try and get this thing not stuck in your head after hearing it just one or two times. The same goes for number 34, where we have James Mercer of The Shins teaming up with super producer Danger Mouse as Broken Bells with the excellent song The High Road. Next up, a song that at number 33, you are lying to yourself if you're at least as old as I am and you say that there is at no point in your life a time where you absolutely loved the song. It was everywhere, it was so enigmatic, and it turned out to be so ahead of its time. Of course, I'm talking about Waka Flocka Flame with the track Hard Into Paint. I mean, seriously, the opening lines to the first verse here, is there anything more enigmatic and instantly iconic in hip hop this year? Got a main bitch, got a mistress, couple girlfriends. I'm so hood rich. Getting well away from that at number 32, we have the tallest man on earth planting his flag on top of the mountain of modern folk music with the great track King of Spain. And at number 31, we have Suzanne Sunfor, always underrated, blending together house and dance music with chamber rock and pop in a way that still to this day it feels like nobody else is doing on the awesome song It's All Gone Tomorrow. I learned my lesson and brought hydration this time. This YouTube stuff, it's its so easy. It just gets easier by the minute. So kicking off the top 30, we've got yet another piece of Danger Mouse production on the Grammy Award winning Black Keys song, Tighten Up, a great commercial rock hit that will get stuck in your head in all the right ways. And at number 29, Kid Cudi goes spacey and vibey on his track, Mr. Rager, a song that I've always felt was pretty underrated in the Kid Cudi canon, even though I was never that big a fan of his. But back to commercial music at number 28, we have Ellie Goulding with the enigmatic and great pop song, Lights. Now, not the version of this song that was played on the radio a lot, the single version, the original four and a half minute stripped back instrumentation version of this song just has that really punchy minimalist house beat that sells her great performance so well. To this day, this may be my favorite thing that Ellie Goulding has ever done. At number 27, the song that inspired a generation of indie pop kids to clap along to it to this very day. I'm talking about Two Door Cinema Club with Undercover Mark. Martin. And at number 26, Foles with what is to this day one of their defining songs, a Spanish Sahara, a track that was uh, talked about at the time for its incredibly minimalistic uh, introduction and build up, but boy, once it hits, it hits so well. It's such a great indie track. Speaking of indie tracks, at number 25, rocking off the top half of the list, Tame Impala, their debut record, Inner the track Solitude is Bliss, a great rock and pop song that is so indebted to Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and the psychedelic 1960s, but if this is revivalism, it's done with a lot of care and attention to detail. And at number 24, we have one of Micro House and House Music's most popular names, Fortet, with his excellent song Love Cry. Now, this thing is long at about nine and a half minutes, but if you give yourself to it, it will show you a beauty and a poise that is uncommon in a lot of house music. The details to this thing, the beautiful little vocal snippets, there is so much care to just get lost in this song. It is such a rewarding experience, and if house music is your thing and you've never heard this, give it a listen, I think you're gonna love it. And at number 23, we get back to the blending worlds of indie and psychedelia on the MGMT song, Congratulations, the title track from their surprise change of pace second record. Now there's a lot of great songs on Congratulations that I really enjoy, but there's something about the sticky simplicity of this one that just had me returning to it for a decade. I think it's a great track. And at number 22, if being musically beaten into submission, just bashed over the head with a folding chair, sounds enticing to you, 
please listen to the Little Women song, Throat One. This is a New York quartet that is coming at you with a blistering, dissonant, and cacophonous blend of sounds that is absolutely mind-bending. And in just a few minutes, if you don't have the best headache of your life by the end of this song, then you weren't paying enough attention because it's incredible. And at number 21, we have the highlight of one of pop music's breakout stars of 2010's dynamic record, the title track from Katy Perry's Teenage Dream. Now there were a lot of songs on this record that may have been more instantaneous, more sticky, more commercially successful, but the intimacy and the personal nature of Teenage Dream have made it one of the longest lasting tunes from this record, meaning that it sounds as fresh and relatable today as it did the day it came out. Blech. Blah, blah, blah. At number 20, Caribou with the often indie blogged about track Odessa, sort of the song that put Caribou on the map. Such a unique blend, especially for 2010, of indie music and electronica. And where indie-tronica has become something that is, is thrown around a lot these days, this is really pioneering, so much so that it's almost like they haven't caught up to Caribou yet. Meanwhile, he continues to innovate on his new records. I think this is a testament to just how musically creative and innovative Dan Snape is. At number 19, we have the Sun Kill Moon song, Alisund. Now this comes from a period of time when not a whole lot of people were paying attention to Mark Kozilek and the post Ghost of the Great Highway and pre Benji era of his music. It is a marquee piece of songwriting from the slowcore legend. It is a fantastic, gripping, and beautiful song. If indie or folk is your sort of realm and you like records like Benji or Red House Painters, do yourself a favor and listen to Allison. Listen to this entire record if you can get your hands on it because it is underrated as hell. And at number 18, a track that wasn't initially a major hit but has had a couple of periods of revivalism, that's what we'll call it, where it gets really popular, Marina, formerly Marina and the Diamonds, with the track Hollywood. Now, this is a song that is great from start to finish, but it's the particular passage that shows Marina's swagger and confidence as a pop star that has been so gripping to so many people since the song came out. Soon as I touched down in old LA, he said, oh my god, you look just like Shakira. No, no, you're Catherine Zeta. Actually, my name is Marina. It doesn't get any better than that as far as pop musicians having that confidence and that swagger. And for this to be Marina's debut record on top of doing that, it's no wonder this thing gets worn out on apps like TikTok. Next up at number 17, Crystal Castles, aka Ethan Kath and Alice Glass, teaming up with legendary frontman of The Cure, Robert Smith, on the song Not In Love. Now, this thing is obviously wonderful, and it can be difficult to look back at Ethan Kath and some of the early Crystal Castle stuff, given what we know now about this music, but other people had their hands on this, other people put time and effort into this, and I don't want to diminish their work making this excellent, excellent final product, because even though the grinding, industrial, intense sound of the first Crystal Castle's record isn't what you see here, this pop take on their sort of electronica is really unique and deserves to be heard. At number 16, we have the bold, the impassioned, the excellent, the 25-minute impossible soul from one Sufjan Stevens. Now, Sufjan over here has always been a risk taker, some of which have paid off more than others, and Impossible Soul is one that has paid off in a big way. This track has so many things that indie rock would come to hold on to and love. The interpolation of electronica on this song and across this entire record is great, and it's really uh, just a testament to how good and influential Sufjan is because he could have made a track like this with trends that died out immediately and we wouldn't have nearly the respect for a song like Impossible Soul that we actually do have for it today. Top 15, let's get it. <clears throat> At number 15, one of the best 
uh, indie discographies of the entire 2010s. One of the most unique, interesting, and compelling songwriters. Perfume genius from his debut record, the lo-fi piano ballad, Mr. Peterson. Even without all of the lush and immaculate production that somebody like Blake Mills would apply to his music later on in his career, this is an example of Mike as a fantastic, gripping songwriter. Because this thing is so short, and it says so much while actually saying so little. The pretty complicated subject matter that he's dealing with, and more so his complicated feelings about it and his history with the titular Mr. Peterson, are encapsulated into this short song in a way that is fascinating and interesting and compelling, and on top of all of that, you'd be hard-pressed to not be humming this thing for the rest of the day after you heard it. This track just has a ton going for it. It's fantastic. At number 14, we have a hip-hop tribute to optimism and seeing the brighter side of things on the Touching the Roots song, How I Got Over, with the hook, Out in the Streets, Where I Grew Up, the first thing they teach you is not to give a fuck. That type of thinking can't get you nowhere, someone has to care. This is an impassioned and lyrically strong, almost hip-hop ballad about perseverance and survival, and for it to be coming from somebody like The Roots who are now thought of as, you know, the, the Jimmy Fallon house band. At one point in time, these guys were a musical force, and this is one of their many hurrahs. This song is excellent, the hook is beautiful, it's catchy, it's wonderful, and the performances, the rapped verses on here, particularly from Black Thought, are memorable and lyrically strong and fantastic. Actually, literally the day that I am shooting this, as in like a few hours ago, the Roots announced on their Instagram that founding member Malik B had passed away. I don't know all the details about it, but rest in peace Malik B, he was certainly a fantastic contributor to some of the band's great albums in the 1990s, and he will be missed. At number 13, we have sort of a comeback record from a band who had taken a few years of absence. I am talking about Massive Attack, the trip-hop legends, who came back in 2010 with an album that, whether it lived up to the hype or not, depends on who you ask, but certainly this song, Paradise Circus, became one of their most well-known and one of their most critically acclaimed, and it's easy to see why. If you thought Undercover Martin was easily clappable, wait until you get the distant, icy, and punctuated claps of this song. If it was ever a musical instrument on a non-Bjork record, it's right here on Paradise Circus. Great track, beautiful atmosphere, rich song that is dejected, but so catchy that you can totally see through it and just enjoy the vibe that this song is putting on. At number 12, we have the song that you're not going to catch on the Spotify playlist. It's not on Spotify, but please do go out of your way to listen to this song. It is the Joanna Newsom track, Good Intentions Paving Company. This thing is a major highlight from Joanna's long, long third studio album, Have One On Me. And while it's really hard to pick one song that encapsulates everything that makes that record great, this is the closest I can do. This track is creative from a songwriting and composition standpoint. It is excellently and beautifully performed. It is well written. Everything about this shows the care and finesse of a songwriter and performer of Joanna's caliber. And if you're not familiar with her music because of it not being on streaming services, this may not be the best place to start, but if you want to dive into the deep end, listen to this because it's incredible indie folk, prog folk, 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 bliss. And at number 11, falling just outside of the top 10, we have a song from Robin. Now, while many people in publications alike consider the song Dancing on My Own to be one of the great pop songs of the 2010s, I agree with them, I think it's fantastic, but for me there is an even better cut from Robin's Body Talk. I'm talking about the song Call Your Girlfriend. This is a hooky, great, confident pop tune, and I love the dynamic theme of Robin saying, call your girlfriend, tell her it's over, because you're with me now, and the 
the light vitriol that she displays on this song is only overpowered by the brash and bold confidence for a songwriter like Robin who is so talented and has been around for so long making critically acclaimed music. It's only fitting that she would drop a song that is so inviting but so cold to the person that it is directed at. As a listener, it's great to listen to, it's great to watch, it's great to hear this story unfold. I consider this to be one of the greatest Robin songs ever. Top 10, how about that? We made it. And let's get into it. At number 10, we have the legendary, critically acclaimed Swedish indie pop band, The Radio Department. Their album, Clinging to a Scheme, is amazing. And my favorite song from this record is the track, Heavens on Fire. Now, this punctuated a long run of nearly unmatched successes, the albums and EPs that these guys dropped in the 2000s. They're amazing. But in 2010, they showed up and dropped yet another great record full of highlights. The sheer bliss of Heavens on Fire is immaculate and intoxicating, and I cannot get enough of this song. Once you hear the lo-fi but warm keys that kick this track off after an also kind of hilarious spoken word intro, everything will come together in, in a great way. Everything that made some of the sadder material of early Radio Department great comes into play here, yet the song is so much more upbeat in nature and just as effective and just as captivating. It's great. It's just a great listen. And in number nine, we see the worlds of jazz, electronica, instrumental hip hop coming together in a way that was unheard of in 2010 through the guise of Flying Lotus on the song Do the Astral Plane. The sampling, the instrumentation, the grooves, everything about this track is just all of the best parts of the different genres that he's working in melded together into a song that is dynamic, groovy, totally unique, and interesting. And that can describe almost every song on Cosmogramma. It's hard to pick a favorite, but to me, the one that has lasted the longest, the one that has aged the finest, has to be Do the Astral Plane. And at number eight, we hear from indie pop's most idiosyncratic voice, Ariel Pink, with his haunted graffiti band, on what has become one of his marquee tunes, and for good reason, the song Round and Round. This thing is just so good. For lo-fi pop music, for a guy who would have never sniffed the radio waves at the beginning of his career, this track is so infectious and instantaneous. The hook to this thing? Good luck hearing it for one time, much less the entire song, and it not being stuck in your head. This is a testament to Ariel Pink as a fantastic pop songwriter, and 10 years out, this thing sounds just as unique and captivating and fresh as it does today. I mean, from the kind of hilarious phone call style bridges, to the soaring call outs on the hook, to the smooth baseline of the verses that carry this thing between its phases, every part of this is just as catchy and infectious as the last, and at five minutes long, this thing is one of the breeziest, most comfortable, easy to listen to, and memorable pop tracks of the year, I guarantee it. Oh, and at number seven, at number seven, while so many of these songs in the top ten come from critically acclaimed bands that the indie world and community love and uh, adapt. Maybe not so much this one. I'm talking about uh, My Chemical Romance with the opening track to their Danger Days record, the song Nah Nah Nah. Now I know that not a whole ton of people like this record. I know that I caught some shit from fans for putting this thing so highly on my albums list, but I love this record. To this day, there is no song that gets me as roused as Na Na Na. Especially if you listen to this thing with the Look Alive Sunshine intro track that precedes it. It is not only an introduction to the fabulous Killjoys, the characters of Danger Days. This thing is just 
the very sound of hitting the ground running. And to this day, there is nothing that gets me as hyped up as a song like Na Na Na. It's hard not to hear this and be way more ready for whatever you're about to do than you were before you heard this song. At number six, the last song falling just out of the top five comes to us via Damon Albarn and Gorillaz, whose record Plastic Beach is full of great songs, whether it's Some Kind of Nature or Rhinestone Eyes or Super Fast Jellyfish. The list could go on and on. My personal favorite of the bunch, however, is on Melancholy Hill, a beautiful little tune that embodies so much of the world building around the idea of the plastic beach. This thing is blissful on its surface, the keys are great, the melodies are high and soaring and easy to listen to, the song is pretty catchy, but underneath the surface, those cheap synthesizers, that slight little whine, it just is perfectly encapsulating for a beautiful world with a small problem, with an underlying sort of dissonance to it, and On Melancholy Hill is great, great representation of that, as great as anything on that record, which is underrated from a storytelling perspective because songs like this use so much nuance and subtlety to get those ideas across. And opening up the top five, we have a record and a band that is synonymous with indie music in the 2010s, Arcade Fire, their record, The Suburbs, at number five on this list, the song, The Suburbs, from this record. If you're not familiar with indie music and you were looking for a way to dip your toes into it, do yourself a favor and listen to The Suburbs. This song is not only a thematically unique and lyrically dense portrayal of life in Arcade Fire's world of The Suburbs, but it's performed so wonderfully. It is rich. The layers of sounds of the instrumentation and the beauty of the vocals and the harmonizing and the great Wim Butler hook on this thing. If the hook doesn't grab you, I don't know what will, because everything about this song is Arcade Fire's infectious and encapsulating indie songwriting done to its absolute, absolute best. So at number four, we have a band who has eluded massive critical acclaim for most of the 2010s, but back in 2010, there was a moment when a lot of people thought that Titus Andronicus would be the next big thing, and that's because their fantastic record, The Monitor, came out in 2010, which contains our number four song, A More Perfect Union. This thing is a blend of true, raucous New Jersey punk music with folk and Americana influences, the Civil War themes, and the nuanced patriotism that appears on this song is so outside of the typical radar of punk music, yet if you turned on the song and didn't listen to the lyrics, it's just as rousing as any aggressive, in-your-face, lo-fi punk song is. But the attention to detail here, the long song structure, the sample that kicks this thing off is absolutely perfect. There is so, so, so much to love about this song. And of course, the literal Abraham Lincoln speech that is sampled in the beginning of this thing sets the tone for the entire song and its take on America. As a nation of free men, we will live forever or die by suicide. There's nothing more Americana punk than this, and that's such a nuanced kind of approach to take, but they do it so well, and this sound and this song was everything that was needed to put Titus Andronicus on the map, and 10 years later it sounds just as energetic and impassioned and fresh as it did all those years ago. If you've never heard this song, you're absolutely in for a treat, even if the way that I'm describing it doesn't make it seem like something that you may normally be into. At number three, no list talking about 2010 would be complete without talking about the indie pop and dream pop band who went on to define the 2010s, Beach House. And now if you ask 50 people, you'll get a bunch of different answers about what the best song from this album is, whether it is Take Care, Norway, 
10 Mile Stereo. But personally, I have to go with one of my favorite songs of the entire decade, Zebra. And not just because of the album cover here, because top to bottom, it is that dark chamber dream pop sound that Beach House is so famous for done to absolute perfection. Beautiful, touching guitar embellishments that hang over this wonderful key phrase that sets up the entire moody and not quite despondent but discouraging atmosphere of the song is all punctuated by Victoria's soaring, soaring hook. Just one of the most triumphant and bold things you'll ever hear on a Beach House record shows up on this song. Any way you run, you run before us, black and white horse arching among us. It's a simple hook, but these words in the atmosphere with which they're set in and the robust performance that Victoria gives to them makes them incredible and one of the most memorable moments on this record and of any song the entire year, period. Now when I released my albums list early on this year, I caught a little bit of flack, as you always do, from the Kanye fans. When I listed Kanye's My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy at number two instead of number one, like that was a big crime that I was committing. And uh, as much as I hate to uh, incur their wrath, uh, once again, Kanye has fallen just short of the mark here, and by just short of the mark, I mean he released what may be one of the 10 greatest songs of the entire decade, Seriously, Runaway. This thing's a masterpiece. In most years, it would be my favorite song of the year. Extraneous circumstances hold it back, but this thing is absolutely song of the year caliber and God, the creativity. Anyone who doubts Kanye's ambition and influence and innovative nature as an artist need to listen to Runaway circa 2010 and look at what else was out in the hip hop world. This thing is just leagues ahead of his contemporaries. The beautiful, the beautiful key phrases that punctuate this entire song. The great hook, the honest and indulgent lyricism, and please do yourself a favor and listen to the nine minute version of this song. Don't sell it short with the five minute cut. I know that the heavily auto-tuned McDonald's talk box voices may not be for everyone at first, but this song as a full composition is as wonderful as anything Kanye has released in his entire career. And that is not even getting started with what I called one of my favorite features of the entire decade on this song. Come on, push a T. Pusha T can do anything. Pusha T is a guy who was coming from these southern rap influenced, hard hitting, boom bap instrumentals as a member of Clips, and he would continue to go on to do stuff like that. This song, if you just heard the instrumental, is not the kind of thing that Pusha T is normally showing up on and killing, yet this is one of my favorite features ever. The charisma the hard hitting delivery and the bars. The bars, come on. Ichabod Crane with that motherfucking top off. Hoes like vultures wanna fly in your Freddy loafers. You can't blame them. They ain't never seen Versace sofas. And please, invisibly set. The Rolex is faceless. I'm just young, rich, and tasteless. Yeah, this song's amazing. Everything about it is amazing. From start to finish, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. It features so many people from Kanye to Mike Dean to of course Pusha T putting in some of the best performances of their entire career to make this thing a standout moment. And yet, even calling this thing one of the best songs of the entire decade, there is a point that just, just narrowly hits higher. And here we are, number one. A song that is a slow burner at first, a bit nuanced, although kooky and hilarious, and a track that has inspired me to bang my hands along with the roaring synth and percussion lead that kicks this thing into hyperdrive. Of course, I am talking about LCD Sound System with the song Dance Yourself Clean. 
You are lying to yourself if you're saying that you've heard the song more than a few times and that your blood does not rush to your head when it is time for those synth breakdowns to lead into James Murphy's soaring, howling hook on the song. Don't you want me to wake up? This is the embodiment of Indutronica and dance punk put to its most compositionally beautiful. This song lulls you in twice, only to pull two of the most infectious punches in musical history just a few minutes apart. Both of the times that this song explodes into loud, epic, anthemic instrumentation and those soaring James Murphy vocals, it works flawlessly. This is a testament to everyone involved in the creation of this song being a masterpiece worker of their individual instrumentations and coming together to craft a ridiculously good song. Ridiculously good, and every part of this thing is ridiculously good. The small, the quiet, the hilarious opener, talking like a jerk, except you are an actual jerk, and living proof that sometimes friends are mean. There's no more James Murphy lyric than that in any song not called Losing My Edge. And of course, the moment that everyone talks about when the song explodes into its most well-known passage. This has become a critic and fan favorite from LCD Sound System, and it is so easy to see why. Every part of this record screams talent, authenticity, attention to detail, and masterful, masterful execution from the songwriting to the performances to the mixing. I can't say enough how good every single element of this song is. I called this thing my third favorite song of the entire decade when I did my list back in January, and I think you could make a really strong argument that it maybe should be number one, because there is not a lot better in musical history much less the 2010s than Dance Yourself Clean. So that's the list, 50 songs, well, 51 songs. Spotify playlist in the description. Thank you for uh, making it all the way through the video. Tell me some of your favorite songs. Tell me something that I missed. This list really went down to the wire. Um, there were Brian Eno and Big Boy and Nails songs that I wanted to put on this list that ended up getting cut right at the end, even after giving myself an extra uh, 51st slot. But uh, making this was a lot of fun. Once again, I have no idea uh, what I'll be doing next, but hopefully it's not too long until I'm back on the YouTubes. Uh, and in the meantime, thanks for watching. Check out some of my other videos, and uh, I will see you next time, maybe with a shorter video, or maybe with an even longer video. We'll just have to see.